Welcome to the Justice Dialogues, an initiative of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I'm Chandra Crane, the Mixed Ministry Coordinator with the Multi-Ethnic Initiatives Department. For this episode, I talk with two researchers and administrators. Dr. Keith Elder is the Provost and Executive Vice President of Mississippi College. He has a Master of Public Administration and a Master of Public Health, focusing primarily on men's health. Dr. Santa Ono is the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia and his research is focused on molecular immunology. In our dialogue, we discuss issues of research, policing, stewarding privilege, and community building, and how to pursue Jesus through it all. A key asset of academia is the ability to interact, to challenge ourselves and grow through our experiences of weighty and complex topics. Dialogue leads to growth. This season of Justice Dialogues brings that strength to conversations on the integration of justice, faith, and practice in the academy. Growing in our engagement with justice is a lifelong journey, part of the work the Holy Spirit is doing in us. We will not always agree with everything we hear, but we can personally benefit, and it benefits the Church Universal when we have these conversations. Welcome, gentlemen. So great to have you here. So let's uh, let's dive in and ask a very important question and sometimes a very intangible question. What does justice mean to you? So Keith, if you would start us off, a couple of sentences on what you think when you think about justice and how that ties into your belief and your faith. <laughs> well, one, one I think is quite expansive. When, you know, when I think of justice, uh, I think of um, uh, trying to correct inequities, fairness, um, and doing good um, as it relates to serving as a, as a provost of institution, I, I think it in, is creating an environment that folks know that um, they'll be treated fairly, um, uh, not so much equally, but, but equal as, re, as it relates to their, their standing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will have access to um, opportunities um, that others have. Great. Thank you so much. And Santa, what about you? What do you think of, uh, especially in light of what Dr. Elder just said? Well, I'd say that uh, when I think about justice, I can't help but think about the book Justice by Michael Sandel. Um, and uh, I remember I invited him to give a talk to all the students, first year students at the University of Cincinnati when I was president of the University of Cincinnati. And I'll never forget um, the way he interacted with those students. Um, and gave them hypothetical questions about what would you do if you were faced with this dilemma. And so for me, justice is, uh, is, is the fundamental inquiry uh, into what to do, uh, with, uh, what decisions to make uh, when you're faced with uh, very difficult problems. And so it has to do with um, justice in, in, in terms of how people are actually treated uh, within society or within uh, corners of society, if you will, but it also has to do with individual decisions that one makes uh, as, a, as, as someone who might, through those actions, affect um, the opportunities that others might, might face. Great. Thank you, uh, Santa. I love how you brought up what was probably a catalyzing event for some of the students um, who maybe were hearing for the first time, oh, this is what justice is and this is how I can participate in it. Can you think of something similar that was a catalyst for you, Keith, or that you have been a part of that you know catalyzed others to look at issues of justice and their faith? Well, when I try to keep this in the context of, of a university setting, I don't know if it's just one event, but it, it's, it's unfortunate that um, many Black students feel disconnected from um, uh, from justice uh, in fairness, even on, on universities uh, campuses. Um, so over my time, almost 17 years in academia, I can, I can visibly remember um, how many students have come in my office and stated that they, were, they weren't treated fairly based upon race ethnicity and, and, um, and how how can I listen first and then provide an avenue where um, that we can address this um, 
uh, in a way that is um, open, transparent, uh, and beneficial not only to the the, per, the people who feel offended, but to the broader community as well. Because uh, I think it's so important that one have broad input and buy-in if you're really going to make significant and long-lasting um, um, uh, change. Great, thank you. And I think it's so telling that both of you mentioned that balance between individual responsibility, but also structural inequities. And for a lot of our students, we're encouraging to, them to go out and be world changers, of course, with the empowering of the Holy Spirit, with the humility of Christ. But we're asking them to look, as well as our faculty and staff, what does it mean to, to be part of that change and to affect their structures that surround them with their individual actions. So thank you so much. In thinking about how we as individuals can do this justice work, but not burn out, it can be tricky, right? And so I would love to hear um, from you, Santa, what do you do to pursue rest in your day-to-day -day work? Oh, that's really a, <clears throat> a wonderful question. And it's incredibly important to take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And I'm talking about all of us in our, in our kingdom building work, if you will, uh, because that's what I think all of us are <clears throat> privileged to be in a position to do. I was gonna actually talk about a couple of examples, but I'll pick one and then I'll talk to you about how I dealt with that. Um, there are too, too many uh, situations involving justice that I can speak about, but one that's uh, relatively widely known is that when I was president of the University of Cincinnati, um, one of our uh, police officers in the university police off uh, de department pulled over an African-American civilian that had uh, driven in the periphery of campus uh, without a front license plate uh, on the car. And he was pulled over for that. And, and then there was a, uh, an altercation that occurred between the university police officer and the civilian. The civilian was still in the driver's seat of the car. Um, the police officer had pulled out his pistol and uh, he shot and killed Samuel DuBose, uh, who um, um, there, was, there was no good reason for, for that individual in being pulled over. And that was uh, relatively early during the Black Lives Matter um, movement, uh, which still continues today uh, and needs to continue today, to be frank. Um, and, and so what happened was that um, um, it became a, the second, the number two news story across all major networks in the US and was covered around the world. Um, and so uh, it's still something that's being worked out. Uh, it's been years since that incident. Um, and it puts you as a leader, puts the whole institution, but puts you as the president of the university in a, in a situation where you have to ask yourself those questions um, that, uh, that really are pivotal to justice uh, occurring. Um, and it puts you in a, in, in a, in a, in, in a challenging position um, as a leader of an institution uh, that killed somebody um, and embedded in a community where people are angry and, and understandably so. And, uh, and so how do you take care of yourself? Because you have to take care of yourself so you can take care of the school, you can take care of the grieving family. You have to go to the, to, and, and it's not that you have to, but I went to the church of where Samuel DuBose attended I met with uh, his mother and his, his uh, kids. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Um, and you've got to do that if you're committed to uh, making sure that justice occurs uh, for individuals and for the institution and for a better, better world, really. And so to answer your question, um, that takes a toll because it's not something that occurs on that one day, but takes years to resolve. Um, and you have to be really at the table representing the institution um, and um, so it was tough. So how do, I, how do I take care of myself in those kind of situations? Um, and those situations occur almost once or twice a year, not to that magnitude, but similar things. And so the way I deal with it personally is I play the cello. Uh, it takes me away from, from, from the situation. It, it allows me to express and feel the emotions that I have that I can't really articulate because as a leader, you have to be strong. And especially if you're on TV, it, you, you really have to compose yourself. But um, those kinds of moments where you're dealing with fundamental issues of justice and injustice in society, and that uh, an institution you care about and people that you care about have really 
uh, that 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 uh, level of trust has been broken uh, really taxes you as a person. Thank you for sharing, and I can hear the grief in your voice still. I love that you speak Samuel's name, um, that you have not forgotten, and that you are honoring him and his family as best you can. Um, that is that is painful, and it's it's painful because we know that's not what God wants as far as bearers of his image to be respected and to be cared for. Um, Keith, not to make you the representative of all black men in America, <laughs> but as a black man in America, how do you find rest? Um, how do you take the privilege that you have, even as you are someone existing in this space of marginalization? I love that Santa mentioned he does something physical, playing the cello, finding a way to express his grief and his feelings. Um, is there something that you could share that would be an encouragement to students and faculty trying to work through their own grief or even their own joy in working through justice? You know, as Santa mentioned, I think it's hard to to get to a point of justice when when you're out of balance. Uh, so I think for me to be balanced, I have to one be connected. You know, that that's in prayer. Uh, so. I need I need something to pour into me so I can pour out to others. Uh, so it, you know I spend time in prayer. And having lost my father when I was in sixth grade, you know God has always uh, surrounded me with uh, with men to pour into me, and I'm so thankful for that. So when these men throughout my churches, throughout my community, uh, pour into me, they pour into me consistently, and that gives me an opportunity to pour out to others. So I have you know, I'm filled up. So it allows me to be able to, to share with others. Um, and I do that consistently. And, and that's really important when you think about sometimes the, I think the unusual burden that, that black men have to carry uh, and in society, not only um, you're uplifted for what you're doing uh, great, but you're also tagged as being um, problematic for the entire uh, uh, race um, uh, as well. Uh, so I think the only way for me to do that well is to want to stay connected in prayer and asking for direction. Because when I try to do things outside of myself, I find myself getting exhausted mentally and physically. Uh, so when I plug in, I mean daily, in asking for direction, it gives me an opportunity to, to see really where God wants to use me on that day. And I can't get outside of that day and start thinking about how the next day, the next day will unravel. unravel. I just have to take that day uh, and, and be connected on that day to what I need to accomplish that day. If I, don't, if I do that well, I, I, I stay in balance and I'm able to be helpful to other guys because it's, it's been my, uh, my greatest joy to, to help men. I, I try to help all, but particularly black men. That's why I was fortunate to start a Bible study at my church about 10, 12 years ago. Um, started a men's Bible study and to see these men get in who happen to be predominantly black get in and share um, uh, their stories, uh, how they overcame or how they're still overcoming and how that actually helps release others. It, it, it has been a, uh, uh, a true joy uh, uh, for me but it, it's really a joy to see, see see those men get together bun and, and help one another i love that you are figuring out what it looks like to be in community and to rely on others and to pour into others that's such a beautiful way that we saw jesus with his disciples walk in these trying times and to reach out with others so thank you for sharing that it's a great segue to um dr elder into the research you've done if you would share and uh, just a bit of how your research into men's health has helped you integrate your faith with your practice and what that looks like and how that could maybe be encouraging to others as they're looking at their own work and how they can pour into others. I think particularly when I think about men's health, uh, an area that's still really understudied um, and really underappreciated, particularly about men's health, uh, uh, a group that has significant issues, has some of the worst, uh, I guess, health conditions overall and medical adherence, et cetera. When I think about how men are, particularly black men, are disconnected from the healthcare system, I try not to think about 
all the bad things or how they got to that place, how we got to that place uh, of, of feeling disconnected and some not are willing to trust the healthcare system, um, how some don't are not medically adherent because of, uh, of issues. How did we get to that point? There's a story that addresses how an individual got to place X. And I think I've come to appreciate um, those stories of, of how um, men got to, to where they are, particularly black men, some of them. And now if I know their story, I think we can, I can better help um, fashion health services research that can help. But without knowing the story and just knowing the outcome, it, you really can't get to uh, the whys behind um, certain behavior uh, continues. So um, I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. And to also to learn that it's, it's a collective, you know, I've never published anything um, uh, as a single author. So I, I think working with others, um, we can't, particularly when you think about black men's health, we can't get to, to solving some of these issues without thinking holistically and, and across disciplines, across professions. And I think that's what I've been very fortunate to be able to do is to work across disciplines to address issues that, um, that you can't solve within, within one discipline or within one person. That makes a lot of sense. And again, it's a great segue. Santa, you have done research on eye health um, and what that looks like. So if you could share also maybe in light of what Keith had to say about here's how your work has focused on helping others um, and even what studying the body can do for your view of God. Oh, interesting questions. Uh, well, I am an immunologist, and my laboratory has studied the leading cause of blindness. It's called macular degeneration. And um, my research has tried to understand the biology of why people develop uh, this blinding disease and to develop a way to detect it relatively early so that you can uh, hopefully uh, slow down the, the spread of the disease, which results in destruction of your retina uh, by your own immune system. Um, but now it's really focused on, on trying to identify the disease early enough so that you can keep from going blind. And the reason why it's important is that uh, from the from, from perspective of what we're talking about is that of justice, in that uh, we want to make sure that uh, this kind of approach is available to everyone, not just, just those that are privileged or that are wealthy, um, and, to, and to make a kind of diagnostic screen that will be affordable and uh, easily accessible to everyone uh, in, in society. Uh, right now, there's too much health disparity in the world. Uh, you can see that incidence of diseases is, is much greater uh, for those uh, parts of, of, of American society that, that are less, less privileged. And so there is a connection between my actual research uh, and, uh, and that's, that's my side job on, on top of being president. Um, but there, there actually is a connection between the research of my laboratory and, and justice. Um, in studying of those mechanisms, um, it's really a, an insight into to what's extraordinary about God in that we're trying to figure out how our bodies work. In my case, I'm trying to figure out how the eye works and, and why it starts to, to uh, go faulty uh, in macular degeneration. And, and so we're just trying to figure out what God already created. And uh, there's a lot of amazing people in, in medical science that are trying to understand what God created and, and to understand um, how to, uh, to, to take the systems and cells and molecules that God created and to use them to keep people healthy. And so for me, it's a, a constant reminder of how um, we pale uh, compared to the, the glory of God, uh, what he was able to create. We're just, I'm just talking about one eye in one species. Look at the extraordinary abundance of species that exist on this planet, uh, not to mention all the non-living non aspects of what makes the world great. And so in studying the human body and one small organ in our whole body, it, it's really humbling. Uh, and, and to me underscores uh, the, the existence of, 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 of a greater God that uh, was able to accomplish everything. Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking about how you said, Keith, about holistically working. And so it's fascinating and encouraging to me to see how both of you are 
taking your unique individual disciplines and figuring out what it means to look at human beings made in the image of God holistically and figure out how your specific research and calling then leads you to make certain choices and to serve in certain ways. Thank you so much. Well, I'd love to hear one more thing um, as we're thinking about encouraging our faculty members, our students and staff who are watching this. Do you have any sort of advice? Do you have anything that you wish you had known then that you know now, or even not negatively, but just here are the things I've learned along the journey. Um, Keith, would you share with us what that's looked like for you and ways you would like to encourage them in their journey? I think uh, some things that I wish I would have known or embraced earlier um, is that um, I have to run the race that's in front of me and not someone else's race, you know, because everyone runs at a different pace. And just because a person gets to a uh, a goal before you does not mean it doesn't mean that you are behind. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's so interesting in academia and in other things as well that you know to uh, to focus on others. And the Bible speaks clearly about not doing that, uh, not comparing ourselves to others. And so I think you know. Uh, Things that I wish I would have embraced earlier is that to celebrate fully what others are doing, but don't uh, compare, because uh, that that gets you that 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 got me way out of uh, of thinking. You know, when you're thinking about promotion and tenure and all these other great things, uh, it can cause I think more stress than it it was intended. Uh, so I always have to get back. If I would have embraced earlier uh, about running my own race at my pace. Uh, I think I would have been even more available to be used by God to, to help others because uh, it would have taken the focus more off myself uh, and placed it in, in other avenues where I could have been of greater service. I, and it wasn't a complete failure. I just think I could have done more uh, earlier if I would have um, uh, focused on the race that was before me and not, uh, and not someone else's race. That makes a lot of sense and thank you because that is, that's a good word that we need to hear over and over again, which is what I'm hearing from you. That's something we need to be reminded of our whole lives. Um, Santa, what about you? As you're thinking about the race that you are running and what God has put in front of you, uh, what would you like to share with those who are listening? Well, um, what I would say is that um, regardless of your faith, um, it's incredibly important for a faculty member or student to look after themselves, um, self-care, as I, as, I, as I mentioned. And I firmly believe that um, a critically important part of, of one's uh, self that is too often neglected is one's uh, faith. Um, and um, there are people who are searching, there are people who are of one faith or one denomination or, or another, but in, in the hustle and bustle of, of, of trying to get tenure and promotion and um, making sure your, your classes are, are switched to remote as opposed to face-to-face. -face. Um, people don't uh, protect enough time in their weekly uh, calendar to explore their own faith. And people are too often afraid to talk about their faith or their exploration of faith with others. And Chandra, we talked about that when we were at Emory. And um, there were different uh, perspectives there. There was one individual who was actually um, a former uh, priest who said, you have to be careful in a secular institution to talk about your faith or your questions regarding uh, your faith. Um, and then there was another individual who happened to be the, the president of the university at the time, uh, Jim Wagner, who I spoke with. He, he was uh, uh, openly Christian. And so, uh, all faculty members have to wrestle with whether to be openly Christian, if they are Christian or Muslim or Jewish, or to be stealth, um, to have that as part of their life, but to hide it from, from others. And uh, what President Wagner said to me is that you have to make your own decision of whether you're comfortable having that label or that part of, of who you are. Then I made a decision to be open about my faith um, and, and to respect, obviously, um, those who don't believe and those who believe uh, in, 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 uh, in other, uh, other faiths. Um, and, uh, but, but it doesn't mean that you can't uh, 
have your own faith and your own beliefs. Uh, it's part of who you are. And so what I would share with students and faculty moving in the future is to protect that part of your week uh, and to, to use it, to reset, and to be essentially a framework um, I, from, from which you, you make decisions that ultimately will help you be more just and to help you mm -hmm. make a contribution for a more just society. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. I love how you talked about setting that time aside so that it can inform the rest of your week. Um, and I love how you're admitting that there are going to be faculty and students who are more self and hopefully then they have the ability to talk with individuals um, who may be more hostile to the faith and then there are those who can be more open. Of course, Dr. Elder is at Mississippi College, which is a Christian university, but even then he's working with colleagues uh, around the country, around the world, and he's working with some students who are not believers. And so I love seeing how both of you are very open about your faith in your own ways. Um, that means a lot to, to a lot of people. And so I thank you for both of your time, for both of your ideas. Um, any final thoughts that you wanted to share? I just want to say that InterVarsity Christian Fellowship has been such a a transformative uh, organization in my own life when I was a student, when I was a vice provost, when I've been president, and that um, I've been very, very fortunate to serve on its board, and that uh, if there's anything I can do for a member of the InterVarsity community, I'm there uh, for them. Thank you. You're doing it right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. What about you, Keith? Uh, it, I just think, you know, as from a Christian perspective, when we live out our lives the, the right way, uh, by loving and serving, I, I, I think um, we can do so much good for, um, uh, for the world. And not only those in the Christian faith, but when we truly love and we serve, it opens up uh, so much space for, uh, for that love to be reciprocated, for that uh, service to be reciprocated. Um, and the other part is that when we're doing what we're supposed to do for Christ, we can see that excellence and greatness is not bound uh, within a certain gender or race or socioeconomic status. We're so much more open to, to seeing uh, the fullness of, 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 of God, the excellence of God uh, uh, through Christ in, in, in everyone. Beautifully put. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. Um, for your encouragement in my own life and in the lives of many students and faculty. I pray blessings upon you as you pursue justice and as we see Jesus doing good work through us. Um, and we, I know, all join together in praying for him to come and make all things right. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for joining us for this Justice Dialogue session with Dr. Santa Ono and Dr. Keith Elder. Thank you to Keith and Santa, as well as my coworker, Glenn Griffin, and his Creative Labs team for editing and producing. I hope this conversation has encouraged you as you think about your own kingdom role in justice, as we all long for the Lord to return and make all things just, right, and new.